I bought solar panels for my house, hoping that they would be free of tax breaks. I mean, they are on the house. <laughs> The history of math is our intellectual foundation for understanding science. Science. Beautiful, awesome, wonderful science. It's the creative foundation for our ineffable future. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Burchak, and this is my podcast, Math Science History. If you like escape rooms, or are looking for a fun date night idea, or you are a teacher who wants to find a fun way to teach math or history, you need to check out Lock, Paper, Scissors at lockpaperscissors.co. They have multiple escape rooms for people of all ages and events, including family gatherings, classrooms, kids parties, adult parties, and corporate team building events. They have classroom material, Cool ideas for date night, like I mentioned before. And of course, escape rooms to download and set up. I got to download their history box kit that is listed under classroom material. But also in this kit, I received extra cool stuff that wasn't classroom material, like pirate maps and a card game. I loved it. It's definitely affordable fun. Check them out. You can find them at the link in the description of the podcast. Or you can just type in lock paperscissors.co. Yeah, you're probably driving your car on your way to work and thinking about tax season. And so I thought, how perfect. Let's do a podcast on Fra Luca Bartolomeo di Pacioli. Unless you are a mathematician or an accountant, likely you've never heard of him. But he was an important person, not just in mathematics, but also in accounting and in magic. He was also important to Leonardo da Vinci, the genius overachiever we all know and love. At one point in his life, da Vinci and Pacioli used to be roommates and close friends. Pacioli was born around 1447 in the Tuscan area of Italy and the city called San Sepulcro. Even though his father was still alive, he lived with a family named Befulci. Growing up, he received an abaco education, which means his focus was in mathematics. In addition to his traditional education, he also studied at the studio of the artist and mathematician Piero della Francesca. Pacioli completely admired della Francesca, and he learned a great deal not only as a mathematician, but also as an artist. In 1464, Pacioli moved to Venice, Italy and tutored three boys who were the sons of the wealthy merchant Antonio Rampiossi. While tutoring in Venice, Pacioli attended secondary school to continue his math studies while working as a teacher, a tutor, and a business manager for Rampiasi. During this time in Venice, he began to write his first book, which included some of the material he used while tutoring. When he published his work, he dedicated it to Rompiasi's sons. However, this work did not survive. After tutoring for Rompiasi, Pacioli traveled to Rome and lived with a brilliant polymath, Leone Battista Alberti, who at that time was working for the Catholic Church. While living with Alberti, Pacioli became interested in theology, joined the Franciscan order, and became a friar, hence the title Fra. As a friar, he traveled from town to town as he taught mathematics at various universities. He taught at the University of Perugia between 1477 and 1480. While in Perugia, he wrote Tracticus Mathematicus ad Discipulos Perusinos, which means a mathematical treatise for the students of Perugia. It was a 600-page textbook dedicated to his students at the University of Perugia. This text was one of his first works that emphasized his skills as an accountant and bookkeeper and highlighted his ability to teach the values of accounting. It held 16 accounting-related sections, including bartering, exchange rates, and calculating profits. It also included algebra. However, portions of this subject are missing from the extant manuscript. After his three years in Perugia, Italy, he traveled to Zadar, which is across the Adriatic Sea in Croatia. At that time, in the 15th century, Croatia was still part of the Venetian Empire. So, while in Zadar, he authored another book on mathematics, 
However, this book did not survive. As a result, of the three books that he wrote on arithmetic, the only one that survived was Tractatus. After his time in Zadar, he traveled to Naples, Rome, and Venice, where he taught at the universities. While in Venice in 1494, he published his infamous work, Summa de Arithmetica Geometria et Proportionalita, which means a summary of arithmetic, geometry, and proportionality. He had made quite a name for himself. He became the subject of a famous painting controversially attributed to the Venetian artist Jacopo de Barbari. From 1496 to 1499, he taught in Milan, where he held the chair of mathematics. It was during his time in Milan that he met Leonardo da Vinci. Then, in 1499, he and da Vinci traveled to Florence, where they lived together until Pacioli assumed a teaching position in 1508 in Venice. While living with da Vinci, he also wrote another work called De Davina Proporzione, which means of divine proportions. This work also included the first image of a rhombocubectahedron, illustrated by da Vinci, who also illustrated the entire book. A rhombocubectahedron is a solid with 26 faces. So imagine a cube, which is a solid with six square faces, but... This is now a solid with 26 faces that include 6 squares, 8 triangles, and 12 rectangles. It has 24 identical vertices that connect, where at each vertex is 1 triangle, 1 square, and 2 rectangles. Also, these rectangles can also be squares depending on the shape of the rhombocubectahedron and depending on the math. What was also remarkable about De Davina Proporzione is that it provided a beautiful illustration of the alphabet and how it should be proportioned. When Pacioli moved to Venice in 1508, he published his work De Viribus Quantitatis, which means on the strength of quantity. It was a treatise on math and magic. Referred to as the foundation of modern magic and numerical puzzles, it contained chapters on math, math puzzles, and magic tricks. It was another groundbreaking work that provided the first directions on how to do card tricks. As a side note, for a neat card trick, check out my last podcast of 2021 called Holiday Puzzle. It has a cool trick in there too. This work, De Veribus Quantitatis, provided directions on how to juggle, make coins dance, and eat fire. Yeah, this 15th century friar took fire to a whole new level. Yeah, I know, I'm punny. <laughs> After his time in Venice, around the age of 61, he traveled back to San Sepulcro and lived out his life. He passed away at around the age of 70 on June 19, 1517. The Summa is his most prominent work. It became a prominent textbook in the schools of North Italy because, for the first time, it covered algebra using the language of Northern Italy. It wasn't in Latin. As an aside, and I learned this studying Italian across Italy, the vernacular was specific to each region. As a result, during the 15th through 18th centuries, the Italian language was not cohesive across the country. It wasn't until the 19th and 20th centuries that the dialects began to decline, and the standard Italian became prominent all across across Italy. If you are a math history buff, there were rumblings that Pacioli plagiarized others' works, specifically with his two works, the Summa and the Tractatus, Mathematicus. Some math historians note that he copied verbatim from other works to write his math texts. And though some science historians may consider that to be plagiarism, others refer to it as appropriation. Dr. Albrecht Hiefer, he's a professor of philosophy at Ghent University, in his two 2009 paper titled Algebraic Partitioning Problems from Luca Pacioli's Perugia Manuscript notes that Pacioli's application and style of argumentation shows an evolution from his older work, Tractatus, to his later work, Summa. Additionally, Hefer notes that it is evident that Pacioli's 20 years of teaching math across Italy and Croatia influenced his pedagogy and writing style. Since we can't fully immerse ourselves into the 15th century to understand what Pacioli was presenting in his works, it's essential to note that we must look at the existing manuscripts to understand whether or not he plagiarized other works. Additionally, we have to look at the style of his writing. And for Summa, Hefer notes that, quote, 
Pacioli introduces a new style of argumentative reasoning which was absent from abacus algebra, unquote. For example, referencing my own research on Hypatia, if we evaluate the commentaries written by Hypatia of Alexandria in the 4th century, she also pulled material from Euclid's Elements and the Almagest. However, these were commentaries, and the one element that defines them as Hypatia's work is that she provided a different pedagogy, style, and argumentative reasoning. Even though the equations are the same, the delivery and the explanations are different. This is how we can define the difference between plagiarism and appropriation. So, back to my story. Pacioli's work, Summa, was one of the first works that outlined a set of tools for accountants and bookkeepers. This textbook provided instructions on how to complete accounting ledgers, and it described the importance of outlining assets, capital, expenses, receivables, inventories, and liabilities. It also showed how to balance a ledger and conduct year-end entries. And he also impressed the importance of the ricordanzi, which means remembrances. This work was similar to a managerial to-do list and included what he called a list of, quote, promises, obligations, and conditional agreements, unquote. Furthermore, and most notable, this work was the first math textbook to describe the process of double-entry bookkeeping. This procedure became the standard for merchants across Italy. The method requires that you record your business transactions twice. The first entry is recorded as a debit. The second entry is recorded as a credit. And at the end of the day, the accountant could compare values to ensure that the sum of the debts equals the sum of the credits. It was a whole new process for the world of accounting. What is most notable in the Summa is that Pacioli inadvertently challenged the math world by proclaiming that there is no way to solve a cubic equation, much like there is no way to square the circle. The story on squaring the circle is in my January podcast and show called Pseudomathematics, if you are interested. This concept of not being able to solve a cubic equation came from when he worked with da Vinci, who showed that one cannot obtain Euclidean irrationals of the square root of the sum of A plus the square root of B when working with the roots of the cubic equation x cubed plus 2x squared plus 10x equals 20. And so, I began the multi-part story by concluding with this story on Pacioli and his final statement in his book, Summa de Arithmetica, where he concluded that, quote, the means for solving cubic equations by the art of algebra are not yet given, just as the means for squaring the circle are not yet given, unquote. In other words, Pacioli declared that it is an impossible problem to solve. This very mathematical statement roused the 16th century competitive math nerds in ways unimaginable. And I mean that. So stay tuned for my next podcast on the competitive world of math. Until next time, carpe diem. I wish I could tell you that the full funding of this podcast has been brought to you through the generous donations of my patrons at Patreon, but honestly, I have just a few patrons. So please help support this unique way of enjoying math and science by joining me at Patreon at patreon.com slash math science history. When you become a patron at Patreon, depending on the tier that you choose, you'll get all kinds of added benefits for your patronage. In addition to my 
infinite gratitude, depending on the tier, you can get exclusive posts about math, science, history, and other stuff. You get early access to the podcasts and early access to the videos. You get your name listed as a patron on my website. You get bonus podcast material. That means more math and science, of course. I'll also have giveaways because I also have a shop now. Yay! And you'll also get a shout out of gratitude on the podcast or the show. So come on over to patreon.com slash math science history, become a patron and support this wonderful way of learning math and science. And until next time, carpe diem.